there's no doubt that procurement as a profession has had a major impact in B2B in the last 10 years and even earlier in some business sectors. But there's a question is how do we get here? Firstly, companies are buying or outsourcing more than ever. Um, you'll hear me talk about uh, on average 70% of revenues coming in the front door from customers go out the back door to suppliers. So procurement is a really big uh, spend uh, item for organizations now, much more than it used to be. It's now a very much a mainstream function. Digitization is making it easier to achieve cost transparency. So there's a lot of digital uh, platforms that are helping procurement professionals garner the cost transparency on what's available in the marketplace. And they're bringing that into their business, not just to understand and inform how they negotiate with you, but also how they manage the compliance with the contract internally once it's been signed. And it delivers near immediate business results. So let me just talk about that for a moment. This is just an example of a typical organization uh, revenues of a billion euros, um, of that 70% purchases, staff 13%. These are numbers from uh, an annual survey that's done by, uh, by a large consultancy in this space. Uh, other overheads around 12% and making profit of around 5%. Now, if, as is often the case, a new chief procurement officer is recruited and they target a 10% reduction in procurement spend, which is not that outlandish, I can tell you, if everything else stays completely the same, but the CPO is successful in taking 10% out of the cost base within one, two, or three years, then the profit the company can generate more than doubles. So the question for the chief executives of, the, of this world is, should they be investing in more sales and marketing capacity um, or even any other function? I should focus more on investing in world-class procurement. And I think what we found over more recent years is that more and more of that investment has gone towards procurement organizations. And, uh, and now we've got some of the best talent around. Nevertheless, it's still a difficult challenge. It's still a tough job. Like any profession, procurement has its difficulties. And these are just two of them. Procurement understands, I mean, for the account managers on this uh, on this webinar, you'll understand that one of your frustrations is usually that the customer doesn't understand value. At least the procurement customer doesn't understand value. But they really do get value and total cost of ownership. But procurement as a business function is driven by the chief finance officer to deliver price savings. So no matter how, how much procurement is trying to get out of the straitjacket of trying to negotiate lowest prices, the pressure from within the organization can be very, very intense. It's also far from being the most popular function in business. It sits on the boundary between the company and the supply base. And often the reality of life is that the supply base is sometimes disrespected by some people within the buying organization. And so it, it has this difficult challenge of managing those difficult relationships with internal stakeholders because they say procurement is, is, is mostly bureaucratic, slow to respond when things need to be done quickly, and in some cases, some extreme cases, actually obstructive. So it's not a bed of roses being in procurement, but having been in, in the field for a long time, it is a, a, a very satisfying and enjoyable place to be, but like sales. So what are CPOs thinking about today? There's no surprise that cost reduction remains the overwhelming priority. It's the primary key performance indicator for the CPO. And as I've just alluded to earlier, it's, it's a barrier to recognizing the value that suppliers provide. Significant savings are still possible from even mature supply markets. So when the category management process is, is, is diligently applied, and I'm gonna talk about that in due course on this webinar, um, on average, savings are around about 7%. So even in a mature market, the chief executive can look to the CPO to deliver significant numbers to the bottom line in the financial year. Many procurement organizations are committed to collaborating with key suppliers, but it's not a given, of course, and your experience will tell you that. And this is the realm of supplier relationship management, SRM, and the creation and capture of value 
after the contract's been been signed. So this is the idea that procurement are like a dog with a bone. They will not stop until they get every last piece of flavor or value out of um, the spend that they're managing. But really the big change for procurement in most recent years, and I'd say this is probably about the last three years, is not the development of procurement tech, which is a feature, but it's about becoming much more customer centric. CPOs are tired of stakeholders dismissing the function as bureaucratic, savings focused, status obsessed, and difficult to deal with. So CPOs are investing in account management skills themselves, believe it or not. So their engagement with internal stakeholders is more collaborative and more productive. This is the new transformation of procurement and it's business repositioning on a grand scale. And 86% of CPOs are now focused on it. So where does this leave account managers in this rather challenging environment? Well, I think there are four questions that really must be, must every account manager must be thinking about routinely asking themselves. So firstly, how much control does procurement have over the customer's sourcing decisions? Sometimes procurement is really in charge and other times they're following the lead from a senior executive in, a, in another function. It helps to know when that's the case. How well do account managers understand the procurement process? And those of you who are account managers, are you involved at the right time? Because timing is crucial in this too. Uh, how does your procurement uh, or service criticality fit into the procurement strategy landscape? So whatever it is that you're supplying, where does that fit on the landscape of different priorities procurement is managing? And then finally, who has the power in your relationship and are you developing the most effective engagement strategies? So I'm going to canter through three models on this webinar. Um, we're going to talk firstly about the model that's going to help us understand is procurement in charge of the sourcing decision or is it the stakeholder or user that is leading? Now, it's really important on this one just to be really clear. We're not talking about individual buyers or procurement executives or any preferences they might have or negotiating styles. We're talking about how mature the procurement function is in terms of its practice. Are these people running well-developed, mature processes full of great analytical tools such as these you can see on the screen right now? And are they using those routinely or are they still behaving in a rather more, less professional, less mature, more ad hoc approach to buying. So we're gonna try and understand what type of procurement organization are we facing? The second one is procurement has a, has a really quite a broad range of strategy options in managing a spend category. So how do they decide which strategy to deploy? And they use the analysis on the, the matrix on the top right hand side at the moment. And then finally, the power relationship. Who has the power? Who's in charge of the relationship? And who tends to get the better part of any deal? So let me start in talking about how much control does procurement have over sourcing decisions? So it's maturity versus influence. So procurement maturity would, would range from the lowest maturity procurement organization might be a very administrative function. It might be junior people or even uh, someone approaching retirement sitting, uh, you know, archetypally in the, uh, in the basement office without any windows, uh, shoveling purchase requisitions from users. But that maturity goes right the way up into some of the most sophisticated organizations on the planet who have been applying best practice procurement methodologies for, for sometimes for decades. And then we look at procurement influence. Now influence tends to go with how much the organization is spending in the supply market from its revenues. So you could be a supermarket or an automotive assembler. Uh, they would be at the high end because you're talking 70, 80, 90% or an oil and gas company, for instance, right the way through to the left-hand side where it would be very low and you might be talking about a professional services firm who doesn't spend much in the supply chain at all. 
And that leads us to diagnosing or helping us identify four different types of procurement organization. The first one, not surprisingly, because I've trailed it already, these are called the administrators. Their focus is on just getting the basics done. They won't have the expertise or the time capacity to process complex value propositions from suppliers and price is their main priority. Consolidators, these are the people who've got huge amount of influence. They have great authority in selecting suppliers on the, uh, over the decisions and they can be the very toughest of negotiators. Their strong leadership role within their organization ensures they can't be ignored either by internal stakeholders or their suppliers. And they do lead the sourcing decision more often than not. Retailers and their control of their channel to the consumer are classic consolidators. Academics, these are the people who know what they're doing. They've all been to procurement school, but they don't typically have a lot of influence over the final decision. And very often there'll be other senior executives in the business who will decide that we're going to use this consulting firm or law firm or whatever it might be. But these people are really, really smart, but often frustrated and they, uh, and, but they've got all the tools in their toolkit and they, they know how to extract value from suppliers. And then finally, in the top right hand quadrant, we have the professionals. These are highly influential in their organizations. They have deep expertise and best practice methods. They are at the heart of all sourcing decision making and are capable of leading cross-functional teams working on major spend categories. And the automotive OEMs are in this category. And there are some others too, but they are the classic example of the professional procurement organization. Now, when you're faced with these different types of organization, um, you have to kind of decide how are we gonna engage? Now, I work with account managers all over the world and large mature corporates. And I'll still say that there is a reluctance in all but a few to proactively engage with procurement. But I guess that's why you're here today. The account manager responds at essentially three options, and I'll just hand it through them now. Option number one. So this is about the focus is mostly on securing or maintaining relationships with your service or product users. And of course, I can understand why that's the case. You're kind of trying to bypass procurement if you can get away with it. But increasingly, the scope for users to make those buying decisions independently of procurement really are coming to an end. And your experience probably tells you that already. Uh, procurement are uh, involved uh, e even here. So I, I would caution any account manager who thinks that they're dealing with a professional corporate customer who thinks that the uh, a legitimate relationship management strategy is to exclusively foster relationships with the product or service users. I think you've got to reach out to procurement, which is option two. Now, option two is reaching out and endeavoring to understand procurement's priorities, their methods, the targets they're trying to achieve and the other challenges that they may have, just enough to perhaps walk in their shoes in order to strengthen your negotiating leverage. It's about, it's about knowing a little bit more about the customer and what they're trying to do so that your desire to, to beat procurement or at least not lose in your negotiations with procurement has a chance of success. So that's option two. And either one of these is legitimate under certain circumstances. The third option is you can really partner with procurement to engage the user community. It's a bit like keeping your friends close and your enemies closer. This is about deeply understanding what procurement's trying to achieve to help it shape a series of value propositions that interest stakeholders and energize them into action. So what that, what that really means is that it's about partnering with procurement so that you can develop the value propositions that tick the boxes for the users, of course, but also tick the boxes for procurement, if that is at all possible. So hopefully lots to think about there about what type of procurement organization and what your general approach will be to engaging with procurement and, and, and learning to deal more successfully with them. Procurement really used to be all about finding suppliers uh, by a thick uh, directory, like an old telephone book. And that, you know, when I started out with Black & Decker many years ago, 
we literally had these catalogs on our desks and if we needed anything we would be scouring those catalogs for suppliers who would supply us with fasteners or plastic moldings or whatever else it would be that's not the case anymore not just the auto automation but nowadays they use a standard methodology which is called the category management process and I'll, I'll go through that in a moment or two but the thing to remember is that this cycle you can see in the bottom right here the typical procurement category manager is around 60 percent through this sourcing process before the first contact with the supplier and that's very different from how it used to be so it's very difficult for you to uh, sell a value proposition into a customer where you don't already have a relationship. So let's just have a look at the process itself. It's used by all mature procurement organizations. And of course, it's, as I've mentioned, uh, pretty much from the outset, is there's much more cross-functional involvement as procurement is building those internal relationships with, with real determination as they are right now. So the category management process, it starts with what we call category planning. It's an annual exercise. Uh, it's essentially done uh, in the chair would be the chief procurement officer and she or he would be um, deciding on what are the sourcing projects we're gonna launch this year. And then we go through a process. We move due north to phase one, which is for any given category or any given category project. So just think of the services or the products that you're selling to customers right now. Uh, they're, they're working with internal stakeholders to make sure the specification that ultimately goes out to suppliers is, is, is well developed and is consistent. Then in phase two, they analyze the supply market and they're beginning to think about, well, in phase three, how many suppliers do we really want to deal with? Do we want to keep the suppliers local or do we want to go global or something in between? And then eventually we go into phase four. Once they're ready and they run tender and market testing exercises, which may or may not be the first time you hear about it. And then in phase five, once they've got the bids in from the various potential suppliers, they undertake uh, negotiations and then award contracts or, uh, or a single contract, depending on what it is they're buying. And then phase six and phase seven are really about the post-contract activities about making sure that they get what they contract for and manage the relationship effectively so there is additional value that can be harvested from the relationship before they go around the whole cycle again maybe one year later or two years later depending on what it is what's really important i think to emphasize here is that this is systematic it's disciplined and it's consistent it's consistently applied across different categories of spend, but it's also consistently applied across many, many different business sectors. So that's the category management process. So think about what you're supplying to your customers and how does it fit into the, the landscape of priorities that procurement is wrestling with when they go through this process every year. What procurement do, they look at two things. They're trying to map all of the categories that they're spending um, on this particular four box matrix. And if we look at the relative category spend or the value impact, you can, you can essentially for simplicity's sake, you can say items towards the right hand side of that axis would be the most, um, the, the, the items or the categories that they're spending most on every single year. And to the left hand side, the one offs, the, the, the small beer, as we might say. And then the vertical axis is around market difficulty and the risk associated with sourcing that. And that is a, 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 a really difficult market, rather obviously perhaps, is when you're having to buy a service or a product from a monopoly supplier. Uh, a less difficult or in fact much easier uh, market to deal with is where you've got many com competing bidders, um, many suppliers from which to choose. Uh, and what procurement people normally find is that where you're uh, sourcing in a highly competitive market, then what tends to happen is that the suppliers do actually most of the heavy lifting when it comes to the deal. Now, procurement uses this matrix for three reasons, and it's worth just emphasizing those. The first one is to set priorities for which spend categories to address first. Because you don't want to put all your effort into spend categories that are small, have a small impact on your business. 
you want to look at it, be looking at the big spend items uh, as frequently as is sensible. And two, it also helps a chief procurement officer decide where they're going to deploy people. And this usually involves putting the most competent, the most experienced people on the highest priority projects. And three, it help, it's to help design what are often quite different approaches and different strategies for each category of spend. So broadly, four strategic approaches. Firstly, what we have here is where we have categories there where the spend is relatively low and the supply market is relatively easy, procurement is all, trying, is all about trying to minimize effort. They don't really want to focus on this, or if they do, they'll put junior staff on this so they can they learn how to do procurement without doing too much damage to some of the big deals. So the procurement classify these as transactional categories. Over on the right-hand side, the supply market is very easy, relatively, relatively speaking, but the value and the spend impact is large. So procurement is looking to leverage all its negotiating power to maximize price down. So that's obviously a very uncomfortable place to be if you're a supplier supplying a category, product or a service in that quadrant. Strategic, um, and, and I will say, I, I work with a lot of account managers who think their products and services are, are strategic. Um, well, they, let me just say they might be to you, but they're not necessarily to the customer in comparison to everything else. So the categories in this box are the ones where the spend is high for procurement, but the market difficulty is also high. So there's only one or two or three suppliers. It may be that the supplier is highly integrated with the, uh, the customer organization, perhaps even through a reciprocal uh, trading agreement. So it's a, it, this is more difficult for, for procurement to, to manage categories in this area, but they have to address these uh, routinely throughout the year. So they're really focusing on and managing and harvesting the relationship uh, the best they possibly can. And finally, where you've got a very difficult supply market where you're dealing with a monopoly, uh, oligopoly uh, type situation and your spend is relatively small, the priority is to manage risk. You want to make sure that you don't get exploited commercially if you're the procurement person, or you don't get exploited um, through the neglect of service. So uh, one of the biggest fears for procurement in dealing with categories that are in the critical box is that they might find that the service is not delivered to the required quality level um, or delivered on time or in line with the project timelines. So procurement definitely places your category, your product or service in one of these boxes but which one is it? And it's gonna be different for everyone on this webinar, and it's gonna be different for every customer that you're dealing with. Even if you're supplying the same product to multiple customers, their priorities are gonna be subtly or even dramatically different, and your category of spend is gonna be placed in a different quadrant. So we have, to, we have to undertake this analysis every time when we're dealing with all of our customers. Power. Who has the power in your relationship? And ultimately, that leads us to the question is, are you developing the most effective customer engagement strategies? So power is, 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 is a little bit tricky to, um, to determine because it's quite complex and it's quite a, um, it, it's, it, it's quite a detailed exercise. And, and, and what we do is we, we talk about what we call power assets. Each side in any negotiation has got certain things that bring it leverage or negotiating leverage or power. And it, it could be the a supplier could have um, an, an excellent brand. It could have invested in that brand for a very long time and the customer is dead keen to get that brand on the top shelf of their retail operation. Or it could be some technical expertise. Uh, or on the customer side, it, it could be that the, uh, the customer has got access to a market it's effectively a gatekeeper to a particular market. Itself has got some uh, extraordinarily exclusive technology that, that, that makes that, that marries well with the supplier's uh, tech. And, those, uh, and, and so what we have to do is, um, and of course, there could be big spenders as, as well. Uh, it's kind of rather obvious there could be big spenders in your, uh, in your uh, customer markets. So what we look at there is we, we tr we're trying to assess the relative balance of power in the relationship. 
so that we can determine what is effectively the best approach to our negotiations and what is the most likely outcome when it comes to who is going to get the margin. Our supplier is going to get a handsome margin from this transaction or are they going to be squeezed by a very powerful customer? Where the parties in a relationship, each of them have few power assets. And this could be something as simple as buying a, a, you know, a cup of coffee from Starbucks on the way to work in the morning. Uh, you can buy it from Starbucks if you're the consumer, or you could buy it from Costa, or you could buy it from Pret, or anywhere else you might choose to buy it from. It doesn't really matter to Starbucks that you didn't show up today, because somebody who didn't show up yesterday is indeed going to show up today and buy the coffee that you might have bought. So where you've got this circumstance where neither party has a significant uh, leverage or power over the other, it's effectively an independent relationship. So each, is, each has little or no dependency on the other. Now at the other extreme, you have interdependent relationships. Their power is contested. Both parties have really strong power assets bringing into their negotiations. And Power ultimately here is, is uh, I might say it's a little bit of a battle of wills. However, however many smiles the, the participants have on their faces, it's, it can be a bit of a battle of wills. Um, for procurement, having such a supply with strong power assets makes it very difficult for them to demand value for money improvements or control the relationship. And of course, this is a good place to be if we're in the supplier's position. Buyer dominance is where the customer has a huge amount of assets around uh, helping, uh, helping its negotiating leverage. And, and here, this is where the, the, the job of the supply is to kind of navigate away out of this box if you possibly can, because you haven't got very much power at the moment, but you want to try and get to a place where the relationship is a little bit more balanced and you've got a better chance of securing um, a deal that is, uh, both parties can ultimately live with. And then finally, we get into uh, where the supplier is really strong, or we might call this the, um, the Microsoft box. Here is, is, is really where you've got a really strong brand. What your job there is, is to, is to work very productively and professionally with a customer, whilst at the same time maximizing your returns from the relationship. It's a really frustrating and difficult place to be if you're the procurement person on the other side of the table. Um, but ultimately, supplier dominance is what we are trying to achieve. And that might take a very long time indeed. So this really speaks to the strategic agenda of the supplier's organization. And even if we can't get there, moving in that direction really can help us. So a little bit about how you do that. Well, we obviously, as I've, as I've mentioned, we need to understand what assets the customer has in its negotiations with us. And your job as an account manager uh, and as a business is, can you somewhat diminish the impact of the customer's power assets in order to reduce their leverage when it comes to negotiation? And uh, there's no time today to talk in detail about that, but that's a really interesting conversation that we have with account managers all of the time. And on your side, what assets do you have? What, what brings, brings you and your colleagues leverage in your negotiations with the customer? And then because things don't stand still, power is a dynamic force. So if you, if you become stronger, the customer has to respond, and if the customer becomes stronger, you normally respond as well. So you have to be constantly vigilant on what it is we bring to the party and what assets we have that can improve our negotiation leverage and also the customer's perception of them. Three models that help us understand the type of procurement organization we're dealing with, the range of strategies that they're using to determine uh, how they buy different categories and how that impacts us. And then finally, how do we diagnose who has the power and the negotiating leverage in the relationship and what it is we can do about that? There's a few more important questions that I just want to leave, leave you with before closing, um, before we go to questions and answers. We also, um, in, this, uh, in, in this battle with uh, our procurement customer, 
we really need to understand how procurement is measured. There are some standard saving methodologies and KPI uh, setups that are consistent across many different businesses. Um, but it's really, really useful for us if we can understand uh, how they put their budgeting process together. And of course, when is the best time to defend our price? Indeed, if it's a price increase that we're after. And then what is the what is your best response to procurement strategic positioning of your service? So or product. So this is where on the on the category management, they've got a number of strategies. Uh, it's one thing to diagnose what customer strategy might be um, in managing us as suppliers and account managers. It's another another thing to to understand that well enough. To, to begin to work out what your counter strategy would be and how can you most effectively engage with the customer to try and diminish the leverage that their strategy uh, is, is trying to bring to their procurement activity. And then finally, how do we communicate our power strategically and systematically? So we're into the realms there of developing a communications plan, or as we sometimes say when we talk about negotiation, a conditioning plan, which is managing the expectation of the customer about how far they're able to push us before we walk away. Some practical steps that we recommend to everybody who's an account manager in dealing with this procurement world. The first one, we want account managers to become familiar with the methods and tools procurement uses. If you do that, you'll better understand your relationships. And then we, we would recommend that you integrate these procurement analyses into your account plan templates. So there's one thing to uh, now and again, to take a look at uh, how procurement operates and see how the other half lives. It's another thing to be thinking about how can we maintain uh, a channel of gathering intelligence on the customer's organization so that we don't get any nasty surprises when it comes to rebidding our uh, business to a customer that's running another category project. And as I've already trailed here, we want you to ask smarter questions of the customer. We want, to, want you to construct your value propositions also to not only satisfy your service and product users, but to also favorably impact procurement goals and their KPIs. I mean, do all of the above and you will more successfully engage with procurement without fear or any feelings of intimidation. Mm -hmm.